Hello and welcome to GC360 where news comes full circle. I'm Deanna Hamilton. And I'm Michael Warwick. On this edition of GC360, the results of the Milledgeville and Baldwin County consolidation vote. And the weird and the wacky of the Georgia College's Rocky Horror Picture Show. And a look into tonight's Veterans Ball. All that and more on this edition of GC360. Our top story. The voters are in and the votes are in and Milledgeville and Baldwin County residents have rejected the idea of combining the Milledgeville City and Baldwin County governments. But on consolidation was loud and clear. Baldwin County probate judge Todd Blackwell released the results in the basement of the county courthouse around 8 p.m. on election night. Residents of the city rejected the idea of combining the government of Milledgeville and Baldwin County by a vote of 1,375 to 767. County voters defeated the idea by 5,170 votes to 2,374. For the referendum to pass, both city and county voters would have had to approve. The issue had been divisive. Consolidation could have impacted jobs, taxes, government size, and voter jurisdiction lines. African American activists argued consolidation would dilute the black vote. At the polls Tuesday, citizens on both sides expressed their reasons for voting the way they did. Well, as far as the way I look at it and the way I voted, I voted for consolidation. And I did that because I believe a single government is more efficient. I think ultimately will be less taxpayer money. And I believe that has been shown by other places such as Macon, Bibb, uh, Muskogee, Columbus, and Athens Clark County. I voted against consolidation and, and mainly because I think it's a fatally flawed document. Um, you, have, you have a document that exposes taxpayers to uh, new and different taxes in, in ways that they're not able to be taxed right now. One is the franchise fees and two is the special taxing districts. You know, they can create any number of taxing districts. In a phone interview shortly after the returns came in, Greg Barnes, the chairman of the committee opposing consolidation, expressed his pleasure with the result. Okay, well obviously we're very pleased with the result. I think that um, the will of the people has clearly been, been shown that uh, we are not interested in consolidation in Baldwin County. I think that um, I, I hope this puts to bed any talk of unification slash consolidation um, for this area. So what's next for our governments here in Millersville and Baldwin County? Well first, proponents for unification say that they're not done with the fight just yet. Speaking with Rusty Kidd, this area's state representative, he says that new unification legislation can be brought back for a vote as early as November 2016. Now both sides can't agree on one thing. It's that for a more efficient government here in Milledgeville and Baldwin County, both the city and the county governments have got to find better ways to work together. Uh, unification would have been a new face on our government uh, so we could market Millersville in a different way uh, than the publicity we've had in Millersville over the last year and a half or so. Uh, but no, I think unification will come back at some point in time. It's a good thing. Wednesday morning, County Commissioners and Mayor Gary Thrower held a press conference to discuss the results. So we're excited about the future. We're, uh, we're moving ahead. Things are going on in Millersville and Baldwin County, and I just I've asked everybody uh, involved to get on the wave and ride it hard. If the wave crashes, get up, dust yourself off, get back on. We very quickly start trying to work together and quit shooting verbal bullets at each other. The voters may have spoken, but advocates of consolidation are unlikely to give up. The battle lines are merely shifting. Consolidation wasn't the only thing on the ballot. Voters approved a five-year extension of a 1% sales SPLOS tax to help fund improvements at the Baldwin County Schools. Unofficial results show 1,485 votes in favor of extending the tax and 537 against. Baldwin County School Superintendent Norice Price thanked citizens for supporting the measure. She called the vote a strong demonstration of their continued support for our schools. And speaking of schools, a recent graduate of Baldwin County High School has actually been raising awareness about the school's Native American mascot in an attempt to get it removed. GC360's Lizzie Perrin looks into the story. 
The Brave. For Taryn Forbear, a Baldwin High School graduate of Lakota Sioux descent, the mascot is an insult to her culture. It's a stereotype. It's taking like something that I see that's very sacred and it's meaningful to me and my family and all of us. And then they're kind of just using it for fun and entertainment and they don't know anything about it. Over the past few years, there has been a national movement by groups such as the National Congress of American Indians to end the use of Native American names for sports teams. The state of Oregon and their, and their state level athletic association has mandated that any public schools that have Native American mascot imagery will have to get rid of it in a certain period of time so they get to sunset it. This is happening all over the country. We are not vanguard, in the vanguard on this issue. We are maybe in the middle of the road, but towards the tail end of the pack. Last year, Taryn began to take steps toward ending the use of the Braves mascot at Baldwin High School by raising awareness. I printed it out, handouts, spoke at board meetings. I did so much stuff. We put tape around our IDs so that you couldn't see the Brave mascot on the ID because everyone has one on theirs. So it was a, it, I did a lot of stuff. It was kind of stressful, but it was worth it. Taryn says that the backlash used to overwhelm her. She said she was sent to the principal's office on multiple occasions for disrupting the learning environment. GC360 contacted Baldwin High School principal Cloyes Williams for a comment about the mascot. He declined to comment on the phone but said he was willing to sit down for an interview next week. The process of changing the mascot for Taryn hasn't been an easy one, as many people argue against the change. The cry to keep the Braves mascot far exceeds the movement for change. A group of my students in my uh, Theories of Racial Stratification class last semester prepared a presentation on Native American history in Georgia and we gave that presentation at the local high school. Um, we were told explicitly that we were not allowed to speak in any way to the issue of mascots. I had to take a lot of just negative feedback from all sorts of people, whether it was teachers, principal, other students, community members, just random people on Facebook. I don't even know. It was crazy. But this hasn't stopped Taryn from fighting. She hopes that things will change soon. I think it could be changed in a few years, but that's just because I'm thinking like of it so positively, like as far as opening people's eyes about it. Taryn says a committee has already been formed to talk about changing the Baldwin High School mascot since she began raising awareness. She represents just one of many battles around the country trying to change the way America perceives Native Americans. Reporting for GC360, I'm Lizzie Perrin. As Lizzie reported, the principal of Baldwin High School said he can sit down for an interview with us next week. We will report what the principal has to say about the mascot issue once we're able to conduct the interview. And up next, time to do the time warp again. Later, Lauren will be back with her weekly entertainment review segment. And just ahead, is it just the seasons changing or is love in the air? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. If you want to be a parent, it doesn't matter how you play, what you wear, how you dance, or even what direction life takes you. You just need to be there. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care don't need perfection. They just need you. Can you help me with this? My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Sure. He helps me with homework. That would be 3.6795. Thanks. Yep. He helps me with my decision making. I wouldn't use this one. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. I'm learning so much. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. 
If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to GC360. It's now time to hand things over to Jai and Jessica for entertainment. Hey everybody, I'm Jai Fitzgerald. And I'm Jessica Vickers. So Jessica, how's your day going so far? It's going pretty good. Had a pretty chill day. Not many classes, so <laughs> pretty awesome day. Yeah, mine was good too. Um, I felt, I woke up this morning, I was in like a really good mood and I don't know, I just, you have, ever have one of those days where you just wake up positive, you be positive, you just you want to say hey to random people on the street. I, <laughs> I know what you mean. That's exactly how I felt. I just wanted everybody else to feel that way and just feel positive about themselves because <laughs> we have a lot of stressful weeks coming up. So We do, we do. It's but last a, Friday marked an event on campus that Georgia College students look forward to every year. It was the annual performance of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. GC360's Amanda Norris covered the story and even dressed up for the occasion. What you're about to witness is a very bad movie. The Rocky Horror Picture Show is an annual tradition here at Georgia College. Every year at midnight on Halloween, Russell Auditorium is filled with excited and dressed up audience members. Among these audience members, some have a V on their forehead. These are Rocky Virgins, which are people who have never seen the show before. Virgin. So, what are you expecting from the show, Miranda? Well, you see, my friend is a tranny in the show. Therefore, I've seen a little sneak peek. And I know the premise of the show, but it's my first time seeing it live. We can assume that Rocky lives up to all these expectations because there are more audience members who aren't Rocky Virgins that come back for more. I love Rocky Horror. I was in it last year, and it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. My favorite thing about Rocky Horror but I'm a theater major, so I like to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. Before the movie begins, there's a pre-show put on by the Transylvanians. We pick very pump-up music, kind of like that you would feel at a club, I guess. And they're dancing, they're being raunchy, they're being funny. And not, not only do those trainees do uh, I work with in the dances, the director and the assistant director actually work with them in the actual show. So. One of the many unique things about this show is the audience participation. While this show is wild and interesting, one of the best things about it is that it's a student production. It's the same movie, the same sort of shadow cast. Um, as it gets passed down, each director does something a little different, and it's, it's really nice to go through the history of it all. My sophomore year, I was um, assistant director, and then it got passed down to me as director for this year. This is Rocky Horror here at Georgia College. I'm Amanda Norris for GC360. There's something in the air this fall, and no, we're not talking about the cooler weather or the pumpkin scented candles. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it's cuffing season where you bring a bay home to your grandparents and oh. you get cold, you gotta cuddle up. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> we're talking about all those new relationships you see popping up on your newsfeed. GC360's Carly Crawford has the story. Fall is upon us. For some, the season means pumpkin spice lattes. For others, it's bonfires, sweaters, and watching the leaves change just as quickly as Facebook relationship statuses do. It's been referred to as cuffing season, which has been broadly defined as the time of year where new relationships start and old relationships turn into engagement. Whether single, dating, or engaged, many students have experienced the seasonal phenomenon in one way or another. Me and Michelle have been dating for almost a month now. And it's been really good. I, I guess like any new relationship is always going to be good for a little while. All right, yeah, I'm single, but I did just go on a date last night, so fingers crossed. Um, I just got engaged in October, at the beginning of October, October 2nd. And um, I've been dating my boyfriend since high school, or my fiance since high school. Um, we have known each other since we were about 12. Some Bobcats do feel that this weather has an effect on their desire to be in relationships. Personally, for me, I love fall weather. 
because it's the perfect time. It might seem cliche, but to take off the jacket and throw on someone, because then I won't be too cold, but then it's still that whole notion of, you know, giving someone your jacket. I think that that's something that comes into play. People want a little, they want that relationship, they want that intimacy because they think the season is more apt for it. As far as summer goes, you know, you have the summer love, summer romances, but um, I feel like that's kind of fleeing. People are only in that for a little bit of time. And then once you get into fall, you know, people kind of go back into their normal routines and start to think about more serious relationships. But could social media also have an effect on this desire to be in a relationship? I think it's very unfortunate the way that we put up relationships on a, on a Facebook because then we think that relationships have to reach a certain goal. Uh, I definitely think social media plays a big part in any kind of relationship. Um, it's really, I don't know, it's really bizarre. People see it all over the place. You know, people post their best moments on Facebook. You never see the bad things. When you see people on social media, you just want to have what they have because you only see the highlights. So when I see my friends post up pictures of their relationships, it's like, oh my goodness, what am I missing out on? No matter how you stay warm this season, whether with a blanket or a boo, it's important to remember that if you're not participating in cuffing season, there's always next year. Reporting for GC360, I'm Carly Crawford. Coming up, sports anchor Kit Southern has an exclusive interview with GC Volleyball's Athlete of the Week, Taylor Savela. And later, we look at sports injuries. It turns out that soccer players are more prone to a certain type of injury than you might think. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Mom and I have a lot in common. <sighs> the great outside. We both love the outdoors. So shiny. That's not a flower. We both love geology. Oh, look. An igneous one. That's not a rock. And she knows a lot about wildlife. <gasps> a labradoodle. That's not a dog. Hanging out has been kind of fun. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. What if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney, and I'm your dividend. Thank you, dear. Well, you're very supple. It's like I was at your age. Back then, I was a sex expert. Used to call me the buttered biscuit. I know about birth control, too. So you can ask me anything, baby. Bedsider.org has birth control information and a lot more. And it's... Have you had sex in this car yet? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to GC360. Now we'll kick things over to Kit and Darlin for sports. Hi, everybody. I'm Kit Souther. And I'm Darlin Davis. Let's get right to this week's game recaps. The women's soccer team made a statement with a blowout win on the road of 6-0 against Georgia Southwestern in their best win of the season. The win clinched them a spot in the Peach Belt Conference Tournament. They continued their success on the road with an overtime victory of Flagger by the score of 1-0. Ali Berry was the hero of the game by putting a header into the lower right corner of the goal. It was Berry's fifth goal of the season. In a thrilling last second win in the quarterfinals of the PBC tournament, the Bobcats advanced to the semifinals. Haley Tidwell put the game winner in the back of the net with just 7.2 seconds left in regulation, giving the Bobcats a 2-1 advantage. They will play the number one ranked Columbus State 
Cougars on Friday, November 6th to try to advance to the finals. Good luck to them. Go Bobcats! Unfortunately, the volleyball team did not enjoy success this weekend as they lost two matches on the road against Slagger and Armstrong, dropping them to 10 to 14 for the season. They'll be back home Friday the 6th and Saturday the 7th as they're looking for a strong finish this season. The women's soccer team has done well despite all of the challenges. And one of them is to avoid a common injury. One of the most common knee injuries in soccer is the anterior cruciate ligament tear or more commonly known as ACL. These injuries occur when the ligament is overstretched or tears. Because soccer is a high intensity and high demanding sport, athletes are prone to ACL tears. And there's no exception for athletes here at Georgia College. To find out more, I sat down with the players, the coach, and the athletic training staff. I tore my ACL during soccer practice. It was a really intense drill that we do that helps us prepare for a game. I was just doing something that I do all the time. It was really bizarre. My knee just skated out and I fell. And I knew right away something was wrong. Although this is a physical injury, the recovery process can also be emotionally discouraging. I mean, it definitely gets hard, but you just have to think, like, this is what's meant to happen. I'll bounce back and, like, just stay mentally strong. We asked Evan Sharon, the athletic assistant trainer, on how the athletic training staff assists the girls physically and mentally. Helping them through the whole process of making doctor appointments, getting surgery scheduled, choosing the right physician, and then um, we do all of the rehabilitation in-house here. So they come and see us every single day. They do prehab, which makes them nice and strong before they go to surgery. And then after surgery is over, we take care of everything for them. And just the that. women's soccer coach, Hope Clark, gave us her opinion on the athletic training treatment for the players. I think they form that great relationship with that athletic training staff. And I think if you are going to have an injury, it is actually probably better to have it in college because of the amount of support that they're able to get daily. The athletes are only supported from the trainers and coaches, but also from their teammates. My team was really supportive the whole time, too. So even though I wasn't on the field with them, I was still just as involved in everything else. Even though ACL tears are unpreventable, when they do occur, it is important to have a strong support team. Hey you guys, and welcome back. Today we have a special guest in the studio. I'm here with Taylor Savella. So Taylor, when did you start playing volleyball? Um, I started playing volleyball when I was around eight years old, so it's been about 10 years. Yeah, um, what kind of drew you to volleyball? What was what was that like? Um, both my parents were college athletes. My mom played volleyball in college and I kind of grew up with it and so it was really important for me to be involved. That's really cool. Um, so what's kind of your greatest attribute for the team here at Georgia College? Uh, I think I'm a really good offensive weapon, but I think I bring a lot of encouragement and motivation to the team as well. That's awesome. That's great. Sometimes it's the best. <laughs> uh, okay, and do you have any rituals uh, before you go and play individually, you guys as a team? As a team, we listen to the same set of music all the time. Um, we also um, pray before a big game. We also um, are always just together in the locker room. And then personally, I bounce the ball twice and spin it before I serve. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, what's your favorite song to listen to to get pumped up? Um, we listen to <laughs> Jordan Belfort all the time. It's just kind of a team thing. <laughs> That's so. awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Taylor. No, we really so appreciate much. it. <laughs> okay, and as said before, you can catch Taylor and the women's volleyball team this Saturday at 7 as they take on Francis Maroon and their home court. Now back to the desk. Coming up, Lauren brings you her weekly entertainment review segment. You want to support our troops and attend the ball? You have an opportunity, but you better move fast. The veterans ball is tonight. We'll be right back. I think someone at my friend's school has this thing called autism. Of course. My friend's brother's son has autism. My neighbor's son has autism. My son has autism. Autism is getting closer to home. Today, one in 68 children is diagnosed with autism. That's about a 30% increase in two years. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs.
Lauren, enough movies? We're college students. We don't watch movies. We binge watch TV shows. So it's time, my friends. There are so many new shows that recently premiered this semester that I finally found it relevant to bring up. And since it's my birthday, I'm going to be selfish. Here are my top five favorite TV shows right now, old and new. Not number five being Supernatural. It's about Sam and Dean Winchester who follow their father's footsteps hunting ghosts, monsters, demons, and other supernatural beings. Besides creepy and crawly, it's riddled with cool cars, great music, a bit of horror, but it can be really funny. There's also some very deep-seated daddy issues, which bring emotional depth to the characters and many manly tears. First five seasons perfectly tie together and they create a great story arc, so if anything, watch that much. It's currently in season 11, so it makes prime bin watching material. With that, we come to number four, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Buffy has always been one of my top favorites. If you're looking for a fun, spunky female role model, you get multiple. As Buffy holds the role of the chosen one, she has to fight any vampires, demons, and whatever else the writers decide to throw at her. The first three seasons are definitely the best quality, and they have the best characters and the best villains. It's all on Netflix, including the spin-off, Angel, which I admittedly watched all of, too. <laughs> it's not as good, but if you're a fan, you're a fan. Number three, and I'm going to loop these two together, and you all know why, Flash and Arrow. The Flash and Arrow are two of CW's newest superhero shows chronicling two friends fighting crime in their own cities, but both have different intentions. Oliver Queen, as some refer to as The Hood, gets a book from his dad with a list of the names of people who are doing wrong along his side. In attempts to fix his wrongdoings, he tells Oliver to hunt down the rest of his accomplices, and it quickly turns to crime fighting from there. While the Arrow is a broody, self-made hero, the Flash is a spunky, nerdy, DC Spider-Man, having fun with his powers but helping the city in the process. In a sort of Smallville fashion, he meets and fights other people who got powers in the same way he did on the night of the particle accelerator explosion. The show's timelines run hand in hand, and sometimes they appear in each other's episodes. Arrow's on season four, and Flash is on season two, all past seasons of which are on Netflix. Number two, The Muppets. Oh my gosh, The Muppets is fantastic. I don't even know how to accurately describe The Muppets. It's The Muppet Office. Imagine the setup of The Office, but with The Muppets. That's about all I can say to describe it. So if you like The Office and you like The Muppets, you'll like this rendition. The first season is currently playing. It's on ABC on Tuesdays, and all past episodes are online. And my current number one favorite show, possibly of all time, on TV right now, The Walking Dead. This show is so captivating, I can't remember the last time I've gotten so emotionally attached to characters. I admit the fourth and like half of the fifth seasons are a bit slow. I know, I know, I agree. But it starts off with a bang, and right now, it's got its bang back. I'm not even going to waste time explaining the premise, because despite maybe having not watched it, everyone knows. Zombies, guns, sadness. That's basically it, and people say to me all the time, why do you enjoy it? It never gets better for them. They're always so sad. Nothing good happens. And you know what? I don't know. I have no idea. But it's a great show. Just watch the first season. It's only six episodes. First five seasons are on Netflix. Just try it. And it's a lot more fun when you can watch it with friends. So that's all I have for you today. Have fun not studying. Let's get back to some news. Georgia's first military and veterans fraternity, Omega Delta Sigma, is holding their first annual military ball tonight at 7. GC360's Kit Souther has the inside look. At 7 p.m. on Thursday, November 5th, Omega Delta Sigma is hosting their first annual military ball. Chapter this President Jordan different. Wilcher shares the details. Uh, the ball will consist of a, a brief ceremony and you'll have a formal sit-down meal, and we'll be dancing and festivities there and all that good stuff. And get excited because you can win a date with a Marine. For every raffle that you buy, uh, we have to do 10 push-ups, whoever's there at the table, and the winner of the raffle gets a full, uh, fully paid for date to Aubrey Lanes with a military service member they're choosing, and the, the military member will dress in their full formal blues. The ball will not only be fun, but will assist a good cause. All the proceeds are going to uh, helping us with community outreach programs such as assisting the Georgia War Veterans Homes and uh, homeless veterans and stuff like that. You know, just trying to make sure that, that the veteran population is kind of taken care of. So come out and enjoy the festivities and support our troops. Reporting for GC360, I'm Kit Souther. <laughs> That's it for news here at GC360. First, happy birthday, Lauren, our yes. own Lauren. Surprise. Happy birthday. We're happy to have you, Lauren. As always, be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat for the latest news. I'm Michael Ward. And I'm Deanna Hamilton. We'll see you again next week on GC360, where news comes full circle.